your praise on my lips. I'll declare your faithfulness. I will sing together of your great love. Songs today remind us to sing. That's good. Forever, God is faithful. Give thanks to the Lord our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he's above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, his love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, his love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us forever. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us forever, forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. By the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise, praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us forever. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us forever, forever. Sing, His love endures forever. Sing this. His love endures forever, His love endures forever, His love endures forever. His love, one more time. His love endures forever. His love, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong. Forever God is with us forever. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us forever. Forever. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for this incredible morning where we are reminded of your incredible, great, everlasting love that does last forever. God, I thankful, I, we thank you that you are faithful, that you are strong. God, that your love endures forever. Regardless of where we've been or where we go, that your love for us still stands strong. In a world where things seem to come and go and pass away, your love, your presence is always with us, is always here, and it lasts forever. God, we stand today drenched and completely covered in your love. There's no escaping it, nowhere we can go from your presence, and we're so thankful that we can worship you this morning, that we can sing the praises that you are due this morning, that we can join together with one heart and one mind and one voice this morning to pour out our praise to you. God, I just pray for uh, the rest of this morning as we continue to hear from you, to be challenged by you and changed by you today, that we can affect and change the world around us to the best of our abilities with your light and your love uh, surrounding us and covering us. God, we just pray for the rest of this morning. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. 
forever God is with us forever forever God is faithful forever God is strong forever God is with us forever forever Amen. Before you're seated, find someone you haven't welcomed to the service yet and do so right now. I should put one in there, though. Good morning, good morning. If you want to slowly but surely find your seats, um, feel free to just continue those conversations. I don't really mind. It's it's probably fine. Um, I just want to share with you guys a couple things. First of all, welcome to Whiteford Wesleyan Church. As you probably know or you should know, and if you don't know, you're going to hear it today. You're going to hear it again later. That Whiteford Wesleyan Church, we have one simple mission. That's to make more and better disciples. We try to do that in so many different ways. Uh, and a couple of big ways are coming up this summer. We don't take a break from that for the summer. Uh, we actually double down and we work even harder over the summer to continue uh, that process of disciple making and disciple growing and equipping all of those things. And so I want you to be aware if you grabbed a bulletin on the way in or were handed one as you were greeted uh, right under the upcoming events in this blue box, you can find uh, some great events that are coming up. A couple other things just to mention to you in case you didn't know, this is, this is the the intro sh spiel, is that correct? Spiel? Is there an H in there? Um, but uh, connection cards are in your pews. If you're new here or you've changed your address or your phone number or anything like that, unless you changed it so that we wouldn't call you, I understand that. But um, if uh, <laughs> uh, the connection cards are in your pew, those are a great way to share with us your information, stay connected. If you have specific questions uh, or comments, there's some boxes you can check. But also the backside is a great opportunity to share any prayer requests, any praises, any way that God has been speaking to you, anything that you've been struggling with, dealing with, that you need prayer for. That's what those are for, and they are uh, meant for that. And so there's nothing too little, nothing too big. Uh, we want to uh, join with you in prayer. And if there's questions you have, we want to try and answer those questions uh, to the best of our ability as well. I'm cutting in and out, but that's okay. Um, so um, if you do fill out a connection card, there's a box uh, on the Welcome Center which says, uh, this is to my knowledge, I just, I just found this out, that it says connection card instead of connection cards, which is weird. You can put more than one in there, though. So it's not just for one card. It's for any connection cards. But, um, but you can definitely do that. Also, uh, if you're wondering, uh, if you're looking at, hey, I would like to uh, give, uh, we do have the two white boxes on the doors on your way out are our um, offering boxes. You can do that on your way in or on your way out. On your way in is the best. That allows our tellers to grab that. And count that this week instead of waiting till next week. You can also give online. If you have any questions about that, I will point you in the right direction. You can come see me. Uh, I can help you out with that. Um, let's see. Also, Sunday mornings, I want to make sure you guys know that Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock, that if you're showing up at 10 o'clock, you're missing, you're, you're missing the previews of the movie. Now, some of you are saying, well, that's when I show up to the movie is after the previews. All right, cut a little close. But you're missing uh, the precursor to service, and that is Sunday school. We have something for all ages. If you got kids, teens, adults, anything like that, we have classes and options for those classes as well. Um, we have teachers standing by and ready every single week for your child, uh, for you, and we'd love for you to be a part of that. It's a great way to kind of prepare ourselves to wake up a little bit and get ready for uh, the service in the morning. So 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings, you are uh, formally welcome to join any of those classes. If you're not sure where your class might be or what classes to check out, come and talk to me. We'll point you in the right direction. I'll give you a map if you need it. Um, but we'd love to have you be a part of that. Another opportunity for you and the whole family is 6.30 on Wednesday nights. 
Uh, if you haven't come on a Wednesday night, come and check it out. Uh, there's an adult class, there's kids, and there's teens all happening at once. Um, and we can uh, do that together. We try to make that as easy as possible, regardless of the age of your child. We'll have somebody to watch them and care for them and uh, classes for both adults and teens as well. Um, if you're looking for that next step, if coming to Sunday morning service is good for you, I encourage you to take that next step, maybe uh, kind of step into either Wednesday nights or Sunday mornings to kind of dig a little bit deeper into your, uh, your faith walk in that way. Um, a couple things. Uh, also, just for teens, Sunday nights at 6 o'clock, we are on. We're going to continue that throughout the summer as well. It's been an incredible time. And if you know a teenager that's looking for something to do or you're trying to kick a teenager out of your house on Sunday evenings, 6 o'clock here at the church, we have fun. Uh, we also spend some time in worship and prayer uh, and, and a little bit of teaching as well. So I encourage you, if you know a teenager that's looking for something, a place to belong, a place to be, Sunday nights at 6 o'clock is a great way uh, for them to do that. A couple things you can see on uh, your bulletin if you have it. Uh, we are planning for Vacation Bible School. That's our summer event for kids. Um, and I know summers are kind of – schedules are always kind of different, kind of weird. Um, and some people can, uh, can't make it the week of or they're working during that time. And a great way for you to participate in this ministry is to kind of uh, join us next Sunday after service. Um, we're going to have a meeting kind of discussing summer events uh, and specifically VBS as well. We're putting a team together in preparation. If you're somebody who's like, hey, I'm usually working during VBS, but I want to help out with VBS, this is a great meeting to come to as we kind of hand out some jobs in preparation uh, to kind of spread that load out and get more done. I think more – the more people who participate in it, the more we can do, the better the event's going to be. And that's what we're looking forward to doing this year. Uh, so if you're interested in helping out with any uh, summer events or vacation Bible school specifically, make sure to stay after service. We'll probably meet in the Family Life Center after service next Sunday. Next Sunday. Um, let's see. Ladies event coming up. Oh, that's not a ladies event. That is you're welcome to the open house baby shower for uh, Abby. And that is, is that 10? Pastor Rick, it's a 10, correct? That's what's written here. 10 is correct. All right, just making sure. May 6th at 10 a.m., ladies, make sure to mark that on your calendar. Ladies' event, swap and brunch on Saturday. I can read. May 20th at 11. Men's breakfast on May 13th. All right, one last thing that I need to say about today. Junior church people, I know there's only a few of you. Uh, we are going to meet just briefly in the Family Life Center after today. Uh, we got a couple things that we're going to touch on this week, um, kind of in preparation for next week's meeting. So if you serve in junior church, uh, even if you're interested in serving in there might be, sorry, if you're interested in serving in junior church, you can also stay uh, as we kind of talk about a couple things today after service. So junior church volunteers after service today in the Family Life Center. That's all I have. I'm going to pass it over to Mark. Thank you so much. Good morning. Stand with me, if you would. You know, our verse for life together ends with a great little announcement. He says... He's doing that so that we can know that we have eternal life. Isn't that a great assurance? Let's read it together. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. 1 John 5, 13. You know, we've been doing series about end times and getting to heaven. And our hymns this morning, we have an opening hymn and a closing hymn. The closing hymn has a nice story, so I thought, you know, can I tell that story? But then the one that we're going to sing also has a story, so I came up with a solution. I'm going to tell both of them. Don't look at Pastor Rick because I'm cutting into his time. But our closing hymn is What a Day That Will Be. There was a young Christian, had not been a Christian for very long, and his mother-in-law got grievously ill, and she was a holy, godly woman. And he was driving along in the car, and he was just mulling over, God, why did this come on such a godly woman? And as he was driving along, he said, God brought to his mind the scriptures from Revelation of all the cherubim and seraphim gathered around the throne. Holy, holy, holy. And as he was thinking about those times, he said, you know, what a day that will be when my Jesus I will see. So he quickly reached around in his car, he found a piece of cardboard, and he sat down and he wrote out the hymn. And I think that's one of the reasons that those old hymns and the new choruses are going to be around for a long time, because they are inspired. They touch the heart of the person who wrote them. So when we sing that last song, there is coming a day, and what a day that will be. Amen? But the hymn we're going to sing now... 
is talking about a roll call. And the songwriter was doing a kid's camp, and he was doing roll call, and there was one teen in particular that he really was working on and praying for her, and he did the roll call, and she wasn't there. And he thought, how sad that she's missing out. And then he thought, Lord, when you call roll in heaven, I'll be there. Is that your testimony this morning? When that roll call comes, I'll be there. Amen? Amen. Grab your hymnals out, page 543. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise And the glory of his resurrection share When the the other soul and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Now, you know what? We're looking forward to that day. Amen. What do we need to do in the meantime? Quick look at verse three. Let us labor for the master. Don't you want to bring everyone with you? Amen. So this is what we need to do now as we're looking forward to that day. So let's sing out verse 3. Let us labor for the Master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all His wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Amen. Amen. Remain standing as we continue to sing. Some have said this chorus has been around for probably the 1800s. It's an old spiritual and uh, credited to the same person who wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic. But uh, it's an old spiritual. I think you might remember it. If not, learn it. It's real easy to start with the chorus. Can we go to the chorus first up there? Can you go to the chorus first? Yeah, you remember this little chorus goes like this. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Away beyond the blue. Remember that? Let's try it again. Just the chorus. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Oh Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me Way beyond the blue I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun Way beyond the blue 
Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Way beyond the blue. This verse goes, I took Jesus as my Savior. I took Jesus as my Savior. You take him too. I took Jesus as my Savior. You take him too. I took Jesus as my Savior. You take him too. While he's calling you. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Way beyond the blue. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Way beyond the blue. Amen. You may be seated. How about our praise team this morning? Weren't they awesome? That's so good. Well, kids are dismissed for junior church. As they're leaving, if you'd take your Bibles, please, and turn to 1 John chapter 5 for this morning. I was telling uh, telling Grandma there. I said, "Boy, your your kids are your grandkids are so beautiful." And she turned to me and said, "You're gonna enjoy yours too." And absolutely, can't wait. So getting excited about that, Barb. It's so good to see you this morning. I didn't get a chance last week to tell you how good it is to see you back in church with us and Dan as well. But uh, so good. Uh, John, First John, chapter five. Did I say First John? If I didn't, I apologize. First John chapter 5, and uh, reading a few verses here, and, and uh, beginning at verse 1. We'll let you sit this morning. Normally we ask, oh, no, I like it when we stand. Is that all right? I like it when we stand to read God's Word. I think it deserves our respect and our utmost attention. I think we pay better attention, too, when we're standing up. So First John chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. And this is love for God, to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For these are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and they are in agreement. We accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater, because it is a testimony of God which he has given about his Son. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony to his heart, in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Father, now just help us as we look into your word, as we dissect it and bring about its truth. And just this morning of all mornings, may we we be sure as we stand before you and in your presence and as we hear what the Apostle John is saying to us, but more than that, as the Spirit of God impresses upon us, may we just know for sure of our salvation and our direction in life. 
Bless these moments now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're about to have a birthday this week. And no, it's not mine. It's my father's. And uh, my dad's going to turn 97 this week. Yeah. And while he's slowed down quite a bit and can't hear so well, he's still quite sharp. And in just a couple of months, my mother will turn 95. I look at them and I realize I might have the longevity gene in me. Is there a gene for that? Regardless of the DNA that I have, one thing's for certain, we all have an appointed time, don't we? When life on this earth will be over. But if you were to ask my parents if there's one thing that they're absolutely sure about as they approach that time, I'm, I know without a doubt they'd say, death is just the opening of a new chapter of living forever with Christ. Now that word forever, that's a big word, isn't it? And throughout Scripture, we, we see that word listed as eternal, forever. And that's a major theme of the Apostle John who wrote this small book that we just read from, and he wrote the Gospel of John as well. And in his writings, John uses that phrase, eternal life, for forever. He uses it over 50 times. It's the theme of many of Christ's great sayings, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Jesus also said it in a prayer in John 17.3 when he said, And this is um, eternal life, that they know you. In John 5, he says, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And to the woman at the well, he reminded her, Whoever drinks of this water I give him will never thirst again. It will become a spring of water welling up inside of them to eternal life. Eternal life is the subject of much of the book here in 1 John. And the words of Jesus then and the writings of John serve as an important reminder for us this morning. Everyone has eternal life. Because death gives way to eternity. And the Bible only gives us two destinations. Only two. So what happens after this life? Where will we go? And how can we know for sure where we are going? There have been many, it's been the topic of many books and debates and lectures over the years. And most religions in some sort try to, uh, in some fashion, try to explain eternal life. And some are a guess or a maybe at best. Buddhism, for example, Eternal life is reaching the level of nirvana, which may require your spirit to go through many different bodies until it's cleansed from all impurities, and that's called reincarnation. Islam teaches that eternal life is uh, e eternal life, and where we spend it is totally up to Allah and how He feels on that day. Judaism teaches your good deeds, and wisdom is the key to the afterlife. Atheists, they just give up and say there is none. A couple weeks ago, we celebrated Easter, the day when Jesus walked out of the grave. And at that moment, he gave us the greatest assurance of eternal life ever. The Apostle Paul reminded us that death, like Jesus, death no longer carries a sting. Because so as Jesus lives, so shall we. But there are several people who still live in doubt about eternity. Some believers are still confused over what it takes to get there. And in my experience, most funerals I have ever done include some member of the family talking about the deceased being in heaven. They're angels. They're working in God's garden. They're tending to God's animals. On and on and on it goes. And I think in, if you would ask most people in your sphere of influence if they're going to heaven most people would probably say, I hope so. But John is writing to people to provide them with certainty in the midst of uncertain times. And he wraps up this little letter 
where he wants to give them and help them to experience the assurance of their salvation that as believers, we have eternal life with Christ forever. And in verse 13, our key verse, John uses these words that you may know. God wants us to know. He does not want us to be in the dark. He does not want us to guess. He does not want it to be simply, I hope so. Now, some of you might think it's very arrogant for people to say, I know I'm going to heaven. And then there are those who would say, no one can know for sure. So let me just settle that issue for a second. John uses the word no at least 10 times in this short book. That alone should tell you. He's like a bulldog in his determination. He wants us to know. He doesn't want us to be uncertain. And like now, the spirit of the age then was that nothing was for certain and nobody could truly know. In fact, in John's time, there was a group that said, you really can't know God for sure in this body because the body was evil. And John is reclaiming what Jesus spoke and said. He said, mark it down, settle it in your heart, rest upon it. Believers have eternal life with Christ. Why? Because God said so. You remember that song we used to sing back in Sunday school? God said it. I believe it. And that settles it for me. That's it. God said it. Let's rest upon that phrase alone. That we can know that we have eternal life. In fact, verse 11, we just read it. This is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. God's given us that testimony. He has given us his word. He's engraved it in history. He's written it on these pages. It's confirmed by the Holy Spirit. It's celebrated by the hosts of believers. And John says, I don't want there to be a single doubt in your mind this morning. I want you to know. I don't want you to have a doubt that if your appointed time was today, I want to move you from a hope so to a I know so. So how does he do that? How does John give us a roadmap then to know for sure? And I think there's three questions that we need to ask ourselves coming from this passage. And the first one is simply this. He says, is he the Savior? Is Christ the Savior? And the first question to settle in your minds and hearts is whether or not Christ is the Savior of the world. Because the general philosophy of the world goes something like this. It doesn't matter what you believe or what system of beliefs you belong to. All roads lead to heaven. Now, Oprah went on national TV many few years back and She popularized this thought, and it caught on. And so many have bought into the notion that it really doesn't matter today what you believe or how you believe, and that we just all wind up there together. And the problem is that many deny then who Christ is and why he came and what he means to giving us eternal life. And so he just becomes a figurehead, not the path. But according to the words of Christ in John 14, He is the only way to heaven. And therefore, not all roads lead to heaven. Jesus said the following, I am the way. He's not a way. He's not a way. He's not one in many ways. I am the way. Did you catch that? You can't get there through your experience. You can't get there through your goodness. You can't get there through your morality. You can't get there through your good intentions or your kindness. There is only one way, and that's through Jesus. Do you believe that this morning? One way. There is no other way. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 10 that our salvation rests upon confessing with our mouth 
that Jesus is the Lord, that he is the only way. Is that your personal conviction this morning? Jesus is the only way. And if he's not, then friends, this book is lying. And everything that you have been taught to believe is simply junk theology. So let me ask you this morning and get ready to answer. I need you to answer this. Wait till I'm done, but I want you to answer this morning. From your heart, is this what you believe? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity? And do you believe that he's the anointed one, spoken of the prophets of the Old Testament? And do you believe in the prophecies of the coming Messiah were completed in him? And do you believe he came as the Savior of all mankind? And do you believe he has the authority over life and death? And do you believe that he's coming again to judge the earth and rule those who love over us? Is that what you believe this morning say amen Amen. that settles the issue there is no other way look at me I need everybody to look at me I don't care what the world is teaching I don't care what system is out there that that sounds good and the feelings good there is no other way except Jesus Christ None. Notice verse 10. You still got your Bibles open? Verse 10 says, if we believe that there's another way, look at this, then we've made God out to be a liar. Because we have not believed that Jesus is who he says he is. And in fact, go to the next verse. Verse 12 says, John says that this eternal life can only be found in his son. It can't be found anywhere else. It doesn't just come upon us. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't just appear. It doesn't simply arrive. The only way is through his son, Jesus Christ. That's it. There is no other way. So how do we know? How can we know for sure? John settles it very quickly. I like this. He just says, well, he who has the son has life. (laughs) And he who doesn't have the son doesn't have life. Very simple. But that leads to question number two. We've settled the first question. Is he the Savior? Yes, he is. He's the only one. Otherwise, everything we read here is false. There's only one, one way. So here's the second question. We move it from a general statement to a specific one now. Now, is he the Savior? Is he my Savior? Is he my Savior? You see, the reason Jesus came was because our sins caused spiritual death that separated us from God. And God, who is pure and perfect and holy, can't allow anything in a I'm impure and holy, unholy in his presence. And in that reason, we're hopeless. There's no way we can get out of this mess. We've tried. But then came Jesus, the Savior of the world, to die in our place, to take the punishment of our sins upon him, that we might be made righteous in the sight of God when we stand before him. Isn't that incredible? That's what Jesus did for us. And when we accept him as our Savior, we inherit eternal life. Now, let me take you back to another part in John. John's Gospel, chapter 3. You don't need to turn there, but it's a great story about a man named Nicodemus who came to Jesus and he asked Jesus, he says, uh, what can I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus just says, you must be born again. You know, we all have a birth, don't we? You, a date in which your mom brought you into this world, a piece of paper somewhere that tells everyone, this is my birth date. And we celebrate it every year, don't we? Some of us don't like celebrating more and more of them as they get old. But it's a milestone, another year alive. But there's another birth that Christ cares about most of all. To Nicodemus, he is saying, you know, you were born once with water, but you need another birth. You, this time it needs to be of the Spirit. 
It's this birth is the moment that you realize that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. It's this birth, that moment that you realize and recognize what your sin has done to you and people around you and you want to be cleansed. It's this birth is that moment where you see that unless you are forgiven, you will never make it into the kingdom of heaven. It's this birth where you'll discover life like you have never discovered it before. This is what we call the second birth where we kneel and ask God to forgive us of our sins and we place our hands and our hearts in him. The first birth, you had nothing to say about, did you? You didn't have anything to do with it. But the second birth is up to you. Your choice today to accept Christ then as your personal Savior. So let me ask you, have you done that in your life? You know, some people say, well, I can't remember a specific day. Some people do. Some people have the date of their second birth down pat. I, I can remember praying the prayer of forgiveness when I was a preteen and asking Jesus to come into my heart. I, I don't necessarily remember a specific date. I may, you may not have it on paper the exact day, but do you know that you've done it? That's the question. Has Christ become your Savior. You know what Jesus said to Nicodemus? Go back to that. He said, you must be born again. You must. Eternal life. What, what's the must of eternal life? Jesus didn't say you must attend church. He didn't say you must give a tithe. He didn't say you must spend hours in prayer. He didn't say you must serve on the church board. You must make cookies for your past. Well, actually, he did. I think he said that one. No, you must make Christ your Savior. You must. That isn't a suggestion. That isn't a hope so. You say, a lot of people say, well, I believe in God. Well, let's stop right there. Not just a few prayers. Not just coming to church once in a while. You must be born again. You must make Christ your personal Savior. If He is the Savior of the world, He must now become your Savior. And John even helps us then to know, okay, Pastor Rick, how do I know if I've been born again? In verse 2, he gives us two words that's going to help us. If we've been truly born again, we're going to love and obey. Which leads us to question number three. Is there been a change in my life? How do I know? How do I know if I've made Christ my Savior? The question is, is there been a change in your life? Well, there's many a person who say, I believe in God. But their life doesn't match it. I'm sorry. It's got to be more than just saying it. There's got to be a change. Something that's happened in your life. A born again person is not the same. Notice what Paul said. Paul said, if any man is in Christ, they become a new creation. Old things pass away. All things become new. There's a change. I like the story of a man, a believer. He's carrying a sack of potatoes on his back and he was talking to another man about his salvation experience. And the other man's a skeptic and asked, how do you know you're saved? And the Christian man let the potatoes fall and replied, how do you know I dropped the bag? I didn't see it fall. And the skeptic replied, no, but, I, but you tell, I suppose, you can tell by the lessening of the weight. And the believer said, exactly. That's how I know I've been saved. I lost my load of sin, and I have found peace in the Lord my Savior. Hallelujah. What a difference that makes when we kneel before Christ. And what does he do? He takes away the load of sin. I love that old chorus. Gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. Now my soul is free, and in my heart it's a song buried in the deepest sea. Yes, that's good enough for me. I will live 
eternally. Praise God, my sins are gone. Can you say hallelujah this morning? Thanks be to God. Let me give you three real quick. John says, what are the evidence then of a life that's been changed? Let me give you three. Verse two, he says, our priority is to love him. Above everything else, he must be first in my life. In salvation, Jesus boiled down the law to one law. Love the Lord your God with part of your heart, some of your heart, an inch of your heart, Pam, help me out here, all of your heart, with part of your soul, with an inch of your soul, how much of your soul? All. How much of your strength? How much of your mind? All. The changed life is one where we are consumed in love for him. And according to John, what's the proof then of love? If we truly love the Lord, what is the proof of our love? John would say it's our obedience. If you have one, you'll do the other. And they're not identical, but the one leads to another. And notice what John said, verse 3. He said, and his commands are not burdensome. I can just hear some people, and I've heard them say that before. You know, I don't know if I really want to give my all because that would mean if I go all in, that means I've got to give up some things. And it means that uh, it might mean that I won't have as much fun. Boy, you... Let me just tell you, the Christian life is one of the greatest lives you'll ever experience, and it is fun. Can I get an amen on that? It's fun. There's nothing boring about this Christian walk and Christian life. When we give him our all, he gives us his all, and hallelujah, what a life that is. We discover life like we've never discovered before. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it what? Abundantly. Hallelujah for that. Let me give you a quote by Oswald Chambers. It's really affected me. The Lord does not give me rules, but he makes his standards very clear. If my relationship to him is that of love, I will do what he says. If I hesitate, it's because I love someone I have placed in competition with him. Namely, myself. Wow. Ouch. If I love him, if he's my savior, I'm going to obey him. And then John says in verses 4 and verse 18, he says, sin can't be tolerated. A person who's been born again does not go on sinning. Now that doesn't mean we never sin. The word overcome is a battle word. We're in a war, friends. We're in a battle and we carry the scars of the battle. But according to verse 18, we don't go on sinning. If we sin, we confess, we get back to living for Christ. We don't make it our habit to do so. Getting over it, overcome it. And then the last one there is in verse 2 where he says we truly must love each other. John spends many verses here in this small book speaking about the importance of not just saying we love, but showing it. Jesus said the following, By this shall all men know you are my disciples if you love one another. John would say then, the proof of your salvation is a life that's been transformed. You're not the same anymore. You've moved from darkness to light. You've moved from death to life. Hallelujah for that. These things I write to you that you may know. God wants you to know this morning for sure. Let's go back to those three questions. Is he the Savior of the world? Is he your Savior today? Are you a life that's been changed? You say, well, Pastor Rick, I don't know. I'm not sure. Why not make it right today? R.C. Sprawl, great author, pastor, wrote the following, just four words, said, right now counts forever. Have you stopped to think about that word, forever? It's hard to grasp, isn't it? 
forever. No ending. I can't even imagine that. But our forever begins right now. Because our reservation for forever happens perhaps today, this moment. The Bible tells us that those who make it in one day are those who have sent their reservation ahead through the blood of Jesus Christ. Revelation 22 says only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life will live with him forever. Can I just remind you what that forever is going to be like? Can we just take a moment here as we close and just be reminded of what those moments are going to be like? Think about it. The curse of this life will be over. (laughs) Your imperfections, which none of you have, right? Your imperfections will have been cleansed. The bad moods that we have will be part of a former life. Jealousy and anger, hurts and pain, suffering, doubt, strife will be no more. Your broken down body will be changed. Revelation tells us that God will wipe away every tear. There will be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. The former things are passed away. Think about that. In our world today, there will be no more sin. There's not going to be any more murder. There's not, hallelujah for this. There's not going to be any more political posturing and lying. Hallelujah. There's not going to be no more heartbreak. You know what else is not going to be in heaven? Boredom. There's not going to be any boredom. You will not be bored in heaven no matter what. I like what one writer said. Heaven is the perfect place of perfected people with our perfect Lord. But heaven is reserved for those who have made the Savior their Savior and have been transformed into his likeness. But would you come and just pray, uh, play quietly? While she's playing, perhaps you're sensing, I haven't settled that question. I don't know for sure. Maybe it's I hope so in your life. God doesn't want you to hope so. He wants you to know without a doubt. You might say, I just don't know. Well, let's settle the issue today. Let's just settle it right now. Would you stand, please? We're going to take a few moments before we sing that final hymn. I'm just wondering, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Just wandering around this congregation this morning. If you, Pastor Rick, would you pray for me? I, I want to know for sure today. I don't want there to be any doubt in my mind. Is there anyone at all just with an uplifted hand? I'm not going to. Thank you. God bless you. God bless anybody else. Say, Pastor Rick, I want to know. I want to know for sure. I'm assuming then that everybody knows for sure. If you didn't raise your hand, do you know for sure today? Father God, thank you for those who are brave and said, I want to know for sure, and I just don't know. And I pray that through this, through your word today and through the Holy Spirit speaking to us, that we will settle that issue once and for all, that we've made Christ our Savior, and the change is evident then in our hearts and lives as we walk with you. What a day that's going to be. I don't want anybody to miss it. I don't want anybody to get there. One day and then their name's not written where it ought to be. Lord, help us to settle that issue. Make you our Lord and King this morning. To let that change settle upon our hearts. To where we love you with all of our lives. All of our heart, soul, and mind and strength. I just pray you'll help us. Give us the courage. Give us the determination. 
to live for you, no matter what, where this world may go, no matter what philosophy may be given, 